TII, item 390, April 30th, 2016, iOS 9.3.2, Beta 3. Welcome to Today in iPhone. Yeah, I like it a lot. Today in iPhone. Hey, go Oh, yeah. My beautiful iPhone, which I never have out of my hand and that I do everything with and has become an extension of who I am. This episode is sponsored by Bowl and Branch. Visit bowlandbranch.com and use promo code TII to save 20% off your order and to get free shipping. Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Rob, and this is the Today in iOS podcast. First up, I want to thank Steve for sending the music here in the background. Steve wrote, Hi, Rob, this song is called Humming at No Cal. And I'm just I guess that means Northern Cal, and was created on iOS devices using Audiobus and a lot of other apps. Regards, Steve Val, aka Rabbi Steve. Rabbi Steve asked, I correct some info. I have said his songs were created with GarageBand and other apps, but he wanted to point out that GarageBand is a very, very small piece of it and many times not used at all. But Audiobus was a big piece of it. And for more info on how Rabbi Steve put together his songs, go back and listen to the beginning of episode 381. It was very extensive and detailed. Thanks, Steve, for the music. And folks, I'll put the full song at the end of the episode. I also want to thank Stephanie for sending in the artwork for today's show. Stephanie wrote the following. Hi, Rob. I took this photo on my rose gold iPhone 6 S Plus and brightened the color and added the text with the Photar app found the tree blooming flowers on my college campus and wanted to use it in my photos back my phone's background and thought I'd share. Drink time is upon us. Regards, Stephanie D. San Antonio, Texas. Thanks, Stephanie, for sending in this artwork. And folks, you can see Stephanie's artwork in the free TI app via the bonus button for episode 390 or at Instagram.com slash today in iOS. And also as a standalone post in the VIP section and at Facebook.com slash today in iOS. If you have some artwork and or music you have created on your iOS device that you would like to share with the audience, please email it to me at todayinios at gmail.com. Please make sure to include which app or apps you use to create said artwork and or music. In this segment of How Wrong Were They, we have the following quote. Quote, the markets are different. The iPhone is an expensive toy for the wealthy and self-indulgent, while the DS is an inexpensive toy for everyone. I think that Apple will succeed in making mobile phone games a bit more accessible and fun, but cannot conceive of their gaining significant share of the handheld market. The iPhone is unlikely to ever compete effectively, as it is unlikely to attract the level of third-party developer support afforded the DS." Michael Patcher, Wedbush, Morgan Securities, 14th of August, 2007. Hmm. I wonder when you say the phrase third-party developer support today, how many people would think DS? Just saying. For promo codes on episode 389, we offered up chances to win promo codes for the app Wallpaper Creation Station, three words. If you're interested in this app or want more info, go back and listen to the beginning of episode 389. This week, we have promo codes for a couple of apps. First up is the app Video Measure Pro. Here is the review from the dev. Hi everybody, my name is Chris from IBM Software. I'm the chief developer of VidoMesher, the first measure as you view app in the market. VidoMesher allows to measure objects that are seen in the camera. Therefore, it overlays a virtual reality measurement grid into the camera preview, showing the object's dimensions. The grid or frame displays width, height and distance of the objects and can be scaled and moved simply by touching the display. What distinguishes VidoMesher from other apps is that everything is done live in real time on your display using the 3D engine of the iOS devices. There is no need to take photos first and then later on do measurements on them. It comes in two flavors, VidoMesher, which is free, offering in-app purchases, and VidoMesher Pro, which is a paid app but contains all features right after downloading it. Should you be interested, please search in iTunes for VidoMesher V-I-D-O measure written in one word or have a look at this podcast's link section. Many thanks to Rob. Well, thanks, Chris, for your review of your app, Video Measure Pro, and for sending in the promo codes to give away. Folks, if you would like a chance for a promo code for this app, send an email to todayinios at gmail.com and put video measure, spelled V-I-D-O measure, one word, in the subject line. 
We also have promo codes this week for the app Night. It's A-M-I-D-A-K-U-J-I and then night, K-N-I-G-H-T. Yeah, I'm not good at pronouncing this one. And here is the written review from the dev for this game. Ghost Leg Rules meets RPG. Select the best path and save a princess. A long, long time ago, there was a beautiful and peaceful kingdom. One day, a princess of the kingdom inadvertently released the, the evil-born gargoyle from a magical book. The evil monster kidnapped the princess and locked her in Amaju Island. Amaju Knight only can save her. Thanks to the dev for their review of their app, Imagunite, and for sending in the promo codes to give away. Folks, if you would like a chance for a promo code for this app, send an email to todayinios at gmail.com and put night in the subject line. As always, just send in one email for one specific app. If you send in multiple emails or ask for multiple apps in a single email, well, then no soup for you. A quick reminder, if you are an app dev or an iBook author, email me if you want your app or iBook featured in the promo giveaway segment for free. We just need the five promo codes or more to give away. Simply email me at todayinios at gmail.com and please include a 60-second or less audio review of your app or iBook indicating you are the dev or author. And when you send in the promo codes, please, please, please make sure to let me know when they expire. Well, since the last episode, which I know was too long ago, iOS 9.3.2, betas 2 and 3 were released. Beyond the normal bug fixes you get with double dot updates and their betas, there was also the combining of night shift and low power mode back together, where previously it was one or the other, but not both. Now both are available at the same time. So again, if you are a dev or you're on the public beta testing group, iOS 9.3.2 beta 3 is now available for you. Apple had their quarterly conference call this week, and how did they do? Well, it depends on who you read. And then it varies from run away, run away, the White Walkers are coming, to just, well, not as good as we'd hoped, but kind of in their guidance range. And in their guidance range is one of the first things Tim Cook said when he announced revenue for the quarter of $50.6 billion versus $58 billion in the year-ago quarter, marking the first year-over-year drop for a quarter since, well, the iPod launched. The decline was a 13% drop year over year, but Tim quickly talked about headwinds and fluctuating currencies and said, really, it was just a 9% drop when you factor in those currency changes. For the last quarter, Apple sold 51.2 million iPhones versus 61.2 million in the year ago quarter. In fairness, Apple did state last conference call, iPhone sales would be lower due to an unusually strong 2015 first quarter, which was 40% greater than the year before that. Tim did talk about the Apple Watch sales, kinda, just saying Apple Watch sales met their expectations, which of course, he did not say what said expectations were, other than to say that the quarter traditionally saw a big drop versus the previous quarter, especially when looking at iPad sales traditionally, how they went or iPod sales, I should say, traditionally. So Christmas quarter, be good. Next quarter, be bad. Or put another way, Apple really, really lowered their expectations for the last quarter, and that is where sales came in, really low. He did say sales of the Apple Watch in the first year exceeded iPhone sales in its first year. And in case you're curious, that means Apple Watch sales were above the 5.4 million unit mark. Tim did say the iPhone SE is seeing, quote, terrific response, unquote, and demand has been very strong and exceeds supply. Gee, didn't see that coming. But none of the sales were in the past quarter. All of the sales so far have been in the current quarter. So nothing to add into the financials for last quarter. iPad sales last quarter were 10.3 million units versus 12.6 million in the year ago quarter. So both drops in iPhone and iPads year over year. Hmm, methinks the iPhone SE and the new 9.7 iPad Pro should have launched a wee bit earlier. Just saying. Tim did say the current quarter sales for iPads should be the best compare year over year of the past two years. Of course, that does not mean growth, as every quarter for the past two years has seen year over year decline for iPad sales. 
Last quarter was also the first time ever for the iPhone that there was a decline in the trailing four quarters of iPhone sales. So yes, the last 12 months of iPhone sales are lower than the previous 12 months of iPhone sales. One stat they gave was that the iPad had 78% market share for tablets priced above $200, according to NPD. Moving to cash, Apple ended the quarter with more money than the Iron Bank with $232.9 billion in cash and equivalent, up $17.2 billion for the quarter. FYI, 90% of said cash is sitting offshore. As expected, per the dividend, it was raised, going from $0.52 cents per share to $0.57 cents per share. Next dividend is on May 12th. To put the dividend in perspective, if you had purchased Apple shares 13 years ago and still have them, you will be getting more money in dividends in the next two payouts, dollar-wise, than you spent for that share 13 years ago. The Apple's earnings report really was not a surprise at all. On Monday, CNN ran a post titled, quote, Apple's about to announce that it had its worst quarter in 13 years, unquote. What they mean by worst quarter is when you compare that quarter to the year-ago quarter. Obviously, Apple's last quarter was much better overall dollar-wise versus most previous quarters in the last 13 years. But growth-wise, it is the first time in over 50 quarters that when you compare it to the year-ago quarter, it was actually lower. That is an incredible run. Or to quote CNN, quote, The last time Apple sales fell year over year was the first quarter of 2003. At that time, the Power Mac was still the company's bestseller. Apple had sold a grand total of 611,000 iPods to that point, And Apple hadn't yet launched the iTunes Music Store, unquote. And all is not doom and gloom. Remember the last quarter of 2015 was the one where Apple reported greater quarter, the greatest quarter really ever for any company, period. And last quarter, as bad as some people paint it, was still more revenue than Apple did in all of 2009 combined for all four quarters. And more than most of their competitors will do all of this year. It's hard to feel sorry for a company that just added over $17 billion in cash to their bank last quarter. Our good friend Philip Elmer DeWitt, who has broken out on his own thanks to a loophole in his contract. Way to go, Philip. Well, Philip is still putting out those lists of what analysts predict for Apple. Per the iPads, the range of guesses was between 8 million to 12 million units. The actual number was almost dead center at 10.3 million units. Way too optimistic was Walter Pycheck with the 12 million guess, and way too pessimistic was Timothy Akruri with an 8 million guess. The closest to the whole honors goes to Kaminder Garcha and Tony the Tiger Saganachi, both of which had the odd guess of 10.48 million. Someone was cheating off the other person. This is the first time I can remember where the pro analysts were both too high and too low, and then also got closest to the pin. So way to go, pro analysts, for a change. Per iPhone sold and the guesses of analysts, there were 47 million on the low side for their low guess, to 54.5 million units on the high side, with the average coming in at 51.37 million units. One interesting note, uh, Philip Elmer DeWitt said the following prior to the event, quote, I've got a rule of thumb, every 1 billion in revenue equals 1 million iPhones sold, unquote. Well, the actual revenue was $50.6 billion, and the number of iPhones sold was $51.2 million. So yeah, pretty close. Quote, The low estimate of $47 million was submitted by Cohen and Company's Timothy Arcruri. The high was $54.5 million, which came from Robert Paul Leto of the independent Brayburn Group. Unquote. Mr. Arcruri is kind of a negative Nancy on Apple, with both the low guesses for iPads and iPhones sold. Per closest to the pin, that honor goes once again to Kavinda Garcha with the odd guess of 51.22 million units. But hey, I guess the odd numbers are working for him, so way to go, Kavinda. Some good slash bad news. The good news is Carl Icahn has sold all his shares in Apple. The bad news is Carl Icahn has sold all his shares in Apple. He is stating he sold most of his shares in February because, quote, I got out because I'm 
worried about China, unquote. China recently shut down Apple's iTunes movies and iBook service. The reason for the shutdown seems to be the ch- that China objects to some of the content in those parts of the data store. No word yet for how long this lockdown will be, but Apple is saying it is working to get them back as soon as possible. This looks to be a purely a censorship issue, with China recently putting more laws in place with regards to censorship, as in adding more laws for censorship, not taking them away. Again, on the plus side, we don't have to listen to the idiotic statements from Carl Icahn anymore with regards to Apple. So let's do a quick recap here. We've talked about Carl Icahn bolting Apple's stock because China has shut out the iTunes store. Well, actually, he was just concerned about China, and then China did shut out the iTunes store for parts of it. We talked about last quarter being Apple's first quarter in 50-plus quarters with declining year-over-year revenue and Apple missing analyst estimates and barely coming in on their own. This resulted in Apple over the last couple of weeks going from 112 dollars a share down to $93 a share, around a 17% reduction or an over $100 billion drop in their market cap in the last two weeks. Essentially, people running around screaming like a Dothraki whore just busted through the front gates. Apple stock beating is not as bad as, say, the one that Stannis Baratheon had, but reading the reports, it seems close. So what is Phil Schiller doing on the marketing side for those don't don't remember, Phil is the uh, C, the CMO, the chief marketing officer at Apple. And what's he doing to help turn the tide? Well, he went on Twitter and was trying to correct the way how we say iPhones plural, where we should not be saying, I have five iPhones. Rather, I have five iPhone devices. You don't say you have a couple of iPads. You're supposed to say you have a couple of iPad devices. Um, okay. I mean, sure, why not channel your inner Manon Fogarty while the tech press is writing about your impending doom? Seems logical to me. Just saying. Congrats to Francisco T, who was able to get tickets to WWDC this year, having won the lottery. As he said, quote, it's super difficult to win them now. You can't do it like in past where you could have your whole team apply. Then if you won... You transfer to the selected team member. Now it's you win, you pay, you go, no refunds. Oh boy. I'm so excited to be able to go though, unquote. I heard from some others about this as well. If you're in a situation where the lead dev in your company is the one that really needs to go, and it was the new entry-level junior dev that was selected, a little birdie told me, If you reach out to your developer contact, Apple might be able to help you out just a little bit there. Shh, don't tell anyone I said that. Now, if you have the TI app, you saw a push message about it late last week letting you know that Apple had opened up the window to register for WWDC lottery. And again, Francisco was lucky enough to win those tickets. WWDC this year will be from June 13th to June 17th with the keynote on the 13th. We will learn um, many new features for iOS 10 at that event or whatever they'll be calling it and which devices will get support for it and which will not. iPhone 4S, I think your time has come. If you are also going, please let me know. So far, Apple has not extended an invitation to me to come over and cover it like Microsoft did with their developer conference. Just saying, Apple. But then again, I'm definitely not holding my breath for that to happen. Later in the episode, I will have the first of those recordings that I did from MS Build. The way Apple let the cat out of the bag, though, for WWDC this year, uh, when it was going to be, was pretty funny. They let Siri spill the beans. If you had asked Siri when WWDC was, she gave the dates and times prior to Apple's official announcement. This was noticed and reported by 9to5Mac prior to Apple's official announcement. Siri, she just can't be trusted with a secret. Interestingly, the keynote on the 13th will not be at the Moscone West Center as in the past and where WWDC is being held, but rather at the Bill Graham Civic Auditorium. From Apple, quote, Monday's kickoff events include the keynote address, which will be at the Bill Graham Civic Auditorium, 
The rest of the week's conference sessions will take place at Moscone West, unquote. I have heard from a few others that won the lot the WWDC lottery. If you are going as well, um, I would love to get your feedback and thoughts while you're at the event. You can call into the show or email said comments to the show. The call-in number might still be 206-666-6364. And I say might because on May 1st, the number is supposed to be shut down and I've been trying to get the number transferred and I haven't heard back from them yet. If it's transferred, give 206-666-6364 a call. Hopefully it gets through to my new voicemail. Uh, fingers crossed, knock on wood, and I uh, hope we get it. But if you go to call and that number is no longer working, you can always record it on your iOS device and then email to me at todayinios at gmail.com. By the way, Boss Jock does a great job for recording voicemail messages and emailing them, and you can get Boss Jock Jr. for free. I want to thank Boland Branch for sponsoring this episode. Guys, you spend a bunch of time buying gadgets for yourself. Why not buy something for the mother of your kids or your own mother? Mother's Day is coming up very soon. And Bolin Branch sheets would make a great gift. The sheets from Bolin Branch are made of 100% organic cotton because organic cotton is incredibly soft. And the sheets get softer every time you wash them. I can easily tell when the Bolin Branch sheets are on the bed and really appreciate them when I travel and the sheets are clearly not Bolin Branch soft. Additionally, the towels. I love the Bolin Branch towels I bought for my wife. Every now and then they get into the regular towel and I can tell as soon as I use the towel, which one is the Bowling Branch. With Bowling Branch, you're going to get the nicest sheets and towels you've ever owned for about half the price of what stores and boutiques would charge for the sheets of far lower quality. I really could not believe how excited my wife was when we got the new sheets and the box that came in would make a great box for the mother in your life to collect all the pictures from the kids. So go to BowlingBranch.com today for 20% off your entire order and use promo code TII. Again, that's bowlandbranch.com and promo code TII with bowl spelled B-O-L-L. These sheets are only sold online at bowlandbranch.com. You can't buy them in any stores. That is how they keep the pricing low and for your markups. But here's the best part. Don't take my word for it. Try them out for yourself for 30 days, risk-free. Bowl and Branch is so sure you're going to fall in love with their sheets that they give you 30 nights to try them out. If you or a significant other don't love them for any reason, they'll take them back and refund you without any hassle at all. Go to Bowl and Branch, that's B-O-L-L, BowlandBranch.com, and use promo code TII to save 20% off your entire order of sheets, towels, blankets, duvet covers, everything they sell, plus free shipping to boot. And all the products come beautifully packaged in their signature boxes. Thanks, Bowl and Branch, for sponsoring this show. Hi, Rob. This is Jeremy from Denver. I'm calling in regards to uh, the caller that was wondering about a good Bluetooth stereo headset. I'm a UPS driver, talk a lot on the phone. I need the stereo. Trucks are quite loud. I'm talking on it now, so there's some real-world testing. I don't know how I sound, but... I've got the Power Beats by Dr. Dre, and I've probably been through half a dozen stereo Bluetooths. These are the best that I've found. They were 129 I think, on Amazon. Hope this helps. Love the show. Thanks. Jeremy, thanks for the feedback. And I didn't do any cleanup there on the audio, so that's how it sounds when someone's in a truck giving you a call. Back to the email bag we go, or actually to the email bag we go. Hi, Rob. For all-around general use, the Platonics Voyager is okay. Like most units, it's not loud enough in a noisy environment. The music is decent even in just one ear. The mic reduces noise slightly. I see a lot of people using the new wave of around-the-neck units with little round earbuds that pull out. Personally, I don't get along with the little round earbuds. They end up falling out of my ears. I've tried Plantronics Backbeat Go 2 and don't like them for this reason. Need a pair of cheap. For headphones, I use the Jam Transit. They are louder than most devices and have separate controls for volume and skip, but no battery level monitor. They are probably uncomfortable after two hours. Keep in mind, having both ears covered while driving can get you a citation. Noise canceling was mentioned and not usually a feature with stereo, headphone, uh, stereo models. 
I haven't found a perfect alternative yet. If you have an auxiliary jack on your stereo, you can get a Bluetooth receiver and plug in there. The Blue Tiger headsets look interesting, and I wonder if anyone has any feedback on those regards, Mike R. Well, thanks, Mike, for the feedback. Hi, Rob. Regarding the fellow looking for apps to collect web articles for later to then get them to read it out loud, I use Pocket. Just P-O-C-K-E-T. Pocket saves articles and videos to view later um, by Read It Later. And for gadget news and Instapaper, for other news, both can save for viewing offline and readily show up on share sheets. They both also have allow you to control how fast pages are read to you. Hope he finds this useful, but definitely worth checking out. Love the show, Tosin O. Hi, Rob. I'm pretty sure that one of your listeners was looking for an app that would read books, PDFs, etc. I don't have this app, but I watched a review on another podcast and it looked quite good, but a little pricey. I hope this helps. And the app that he's recommending here is Voice Dream Reader by Voice Dream LLC. Regards from Bob in Hamilton. Well, thanks, Bob, for that. Hi, Rob. I love the podcast. Never miss an episode. Hey, don't tell me. Tell your friends. This is Gil in Boston, who asked about an app to gather web articles and read them aloud in episode 389. Voice Dream Reader, oh, we got another vote for that, is an excellent app for reading articles and other text, including ebooks. You can send articles to it from the share sheet in Safari, stripping out headers and ads if you choose. While reading it, it, res- while reading, it responds to playback control buttons, just like an audio player. I have been using the app for several years. It is great for lots of reasons, not the least of which is how well it copes with bad spelling or OCC, OCR formatting errors. If you get this app, be sure to read the article it comes with describing the features. Some of them are hugely useful things I never would have thought of even looking for. I can't recommend this app highly enough. Unfortunately, I don't know how well this app works with voiceover as I'm not a voiceover user. I have to look at the screen once in a while to add and sort books. Once started though, it can read through all the books or articles in a playlist without ever leaving my pocket. Regards, Phil W. Well, thanks Phil for the uh, second vote there for voice dream reader. Into the email bag we go. Hi Rob, for the person in, in episode 389 looking for an app to read content out loud, Oops, we have a third one. Voice Dream Reader is a good app for that. It can read PDF documents, text, web pages. There are many high quality voice, um, uh, both free and paid, or voices, both free and paid. I am visually impaired, and this is the app I use. Regards, James M. Back to the email bag. Hi, Rob. One person on your latest episode, TII389, asked about some reading apps that has a web browser that can read your articles out loud. I use Capti, C-A-P-T-I, Narrator, which is free, and then Voice Dream Reader. Fourth vote for Voice Dream Reader, which is $10. Have a great day. Regards, Maria. Back to the email bag. Our listener asked about text reading apps. My favorite one of these, and I've tried many, is, you guessed it, Voice Dream Reader. Lots of different great voices. Some of them cost money as in purchases. But some of them are worth it because they add more enjoyment or entertainment value to the listening. For example, there's a Queen Elizabeth voice. Highly recommended. Regards, Steve. And then, hi, Rob. Voice Dream Reader. That's like the seventh vote for Voice Dream Reader. It's a fantastic app that can save and read text from web articles aloud. It's a bit expensive for an app, but for all that Voice Dream Reader can do, it's worth every cent it costs. And Voice Dream does more than save web articles. It integrates with Dropbox, iCloud Drive, Pocket, and a few other services. You can even send files to the app through iTunes. It reads plain text files, RTF, PowerPoint, and Microsoft Word files. It handles all the types associated with iWork and can even play MP3s for those who enjoy audiobooks. In essence, Voice Dream Reader is a complete ebook reader, but its ability to save and read web pages aloud is why I recommend it. The app has had a massive update recently and it works incredibly well, especially on the iPhone 5S and later. I use the app all the time and I really love it. Voice Dream Reader is primarily marketed to students and the visually impaired, but anyone can use it 
and enjoy its features. Hope this info helps in some way. Regards, Sandy. I cannot remember any other app ever dominating replies like Voice Dream Reader did. So I'm thinking the the winner here is Voice Dream Reader. But hey, we've got one more voicemail. So let's get into that and see what Colby has to say. Hi, Rob. It's Colby from Colorado. I'm calling in response to, I think his name was Dale, wanting to be able to have text read out loud in the car. One way I know you can do this is if Dale uses a Mac, he can select all of those files that he wants read to him, and then he can actually convert them to spoken tracks in his iTunes and then sync them to his iPhone. And then he can just open them and play them as AAC files in in his music player. And also, I just last month, well, in March, beginning of March, upgraded from a 5S, from a 16 gigabyte 5S to a 128 gigabyte 6S Plus, and I love it. It is the best iPhone I have owned, and it is also iPhone number eight. So keep up the good work, and um, I hope that little tip helps Dale, and really appreciate your show. Thanks. Bye. Colby and everyone else that sent in feedback, thank you so much for your feedback. It's all greatly appreciated. And once again, it was Voice Dream Reader seemed to be the winner. And then there was also Capti Narrator and Pocket and Instapaper were the other ones that were recommended. But Voice Dream Reader was recommended by a lot. We are now over 3,000 members on our Google Plus community and growing. Thanks to everyone that has joined and thanks for the great posts. One new post in the Google Plus community that went up since the last episode came from Brian Fitz, who posted the following, quote, why do you think Apple is holding back uh, devs back from providing watch faces for the Apple Watch. Seems they could sell more watches if there was more of a selection on watch faces, unquote. To which Richard Del Franco replied, quote, that's the one thing I want more than anything else, more watch faces. I don't get why they d- wouldn't do it, unquote. And Brian then replied back to him saying, when the Apple Watch was first announced, What got me the most excited was the idea of unlimited number of watch faces and a ton of uh, battery time to keep those faces visible. Not quite there, but then again, it's only the first generation. Maybe a jailbreak is what is needed to move things along, unquote. To which I say, yeah, why are there not more watch faces allowed? It makes no sense. I would love some extra, very customized watch faces. Maybe the next watch OS 3.0 will allow for this. Fingers crossed. Since the last episode, there were also dozens and dozens of other new posts and comments on the TII Google Plus community, which is an Android fanboys free zone and a spammer free zone. Yep, it is the most civil Google Plus community covering iOS. Folks, go to today in iOS.com slash community to join in. And thanks to all 3,000 plus of you already members in the community and that are com- contributing. Also from the Google Plus community, there were these comments per the last episode, which I always pin the last episode at the top, from Francisco Tapia, quote, Rubulch, in response to your question, who wants a thinner iPhone with a camera bump? You and everyone else in, in that who is pocketing an iPhone 6 success. You vote with your money, and Apple was encouraged to continue down this path with the introduction of the new camera bump and models. I held out, I bought the SC, which is the form factor I had been waiting for. Better battery, no camera bump. It is difficult at times to say no to these new iOS devices, but you only encourage a bad user experience when you keep compromising what you really want over the shiny, new, crazy, thin, almost no battery phone, unquote. Well, The only break in that logic is Apple has no way of knowing what specific feature you did not buy because of. Just because I purchased something doesn't mean I have to like every feature. Now, if Apple offered the exact same specs, with the only exception being thickness and the camera bump, I can guarantee you I know which one most people would be buying. Thanks to Tash for this next one. And this is about that nasty little bug where if you manually change the date of an iOS 
device to January 1st, 1970, it would brick your iOS device. Kind of Apple's way of saying time travel is a bad thing. We mentioned that bug a couple of months ago and said, don't do that. Well, now it has been shown that ne'er-do-wells could set up Wi-Fi networks where the network time is set to January 1st, 1970. And if you connect to said network and have your iOS device set to update to network time, you guessed it, a brick your iOS device does become. Now you think, well, I just will not connect to said Wi-Fi network. Well, all the hackers have to do is spoof the network name of something like AT&T Wi-Fi, which is what you see at Starbucks. And when your iPhone sees that, it will think it has a trusted Wi-Fi network and connect and self-destruct if the date is set to January 1st, 1970. So how do you keep this from happening? Simple. Update to iOS 9.3.1. And kids, don't try this 1970s hack at home. From what I read, it really does brick the device and even makes the temperature on the device really run hot. So in that process uh, to becoming a brick, it first becomes a toaster. Yeah, again, not something you want to try to see what happens or do to your friend's iOS device as a joke. You know, yeah, if you have not updated to 9.3.1, you really need to do so. And you want to ASAP, especially if you travel a lot or have friends that think when you're sleeping on the couch in the middle of the day, it's okay to light off an M80 in the room to wake up you type friends. There were a few misreported stories out there about iPhones dying. One such title was, quote, Apple says iPhones are ticking time bombs. Should you still buy one? Question mark. Unquote. From daysinfo.com. It seems some of these articles latched onto this one quote in Apple's recycling docs. Quote, years of use, which are based on first owners, are assumed to be four years for OS uh, 10 devices and TV OS devices and three years for iOS and watch OS devices. Unquote. First saying that the original owners of iOS devices is three years for the first owner is not saying they die in three years. It's just saying people that buy new iOS devices on average will upgrade to a new device in three years. Most of you listening have an iOS device that is well over three years old. Some like me have the original iPhone, which is still working, as is the original iPad. Additionally, they tried in the article to say Apple is killing iOS devices with software updates. First, not true. But second, at least Apple has software updates. The iPhone 4S is still supported, and it was released on October 2011. That's five and a half years ago. And oh yeah, it is still supported with new updates. There are no Android devices, a year younger even, still being officially supported with the latest updates. None. None. Zip. It is just funny the articles that ran with this story tried to either say the devices died in three years or were obsoleted in three years which neither is the case. There was rumors from IB Times out of the UK that says, quote, Apple has a secret team working on bringing potential changes to the App Store. As many as 100 employees, including engineers from the company's advertising group IED, are working on the project. Apple is considering paid search, a model that Google is already using, wherein developers would have to pay to have their app shown at the top of the search results, unquote. My initial reaction is, nope, not going to happen. Not paid search. I don't see Apple sullying up the user experience like that. To this point, Apple has proudly and strongly pointed out that there is no pay for placement in iTunes. Not for music, not for podcasts, not for TV shows or movies, and not for iBooks or definitely not for apps. Apple has teams of people curating content in different categories for featured picks and uses algorithms for top charts and search results. So now all of a sudden Apple is going to turn on paid advertising so companies with crappy apps that could not get their app to the top of the charts via merit can pay their way to the top and thus have users downloading and buying crappy apps from people with larger budgets for advertising. Hmm. Exactly where in all of that does the end user benefit? Maybe I'm wrong, but when I listen to my little birds, that is not what they are saying. I just 
don't see Apple making such a big pivot and one that does not help the end user and really likely will hurt the end user. Paid advertising makes sense when your customers are advertisers. Paid advertising does not make sense when your customers are the end users. Just saying. A Japanese site posted what is supposed to be schematics of the next iPhone, the iPhone 7 Plus. The schematics show a dual camera module. We've talked about that before. No headphone jack. We've talked about that ad nauseum. And just one speaker. Not dual speakers, which had been what we had been talking about previously ad nauseum. Essentially, the iPhone 7 Plus looks a lot, a lot like the iPhone 6 Plus and 6S Plus. Actually, it has the exact identical dimensions, with the exception of the dual camera and no headphone jack and possibly the smart connector. Now, call me cynical, but for some reason, I just don't see people getting excited by a new iPhone where the biggest innovation will be the removal of the headphone jack. Psst, Apple. That is not a feature. That is a hassle. Nothing like giving iPhone users a reason not to update this year. Hey, Rob, this is Angel from Virginia. I was calling in reference to that guy that called from Montreal that had the problem with pressing that home button and Siri would would constantly come up. I had the same problem. I would uh, press the home button to close an app, and I would get Siri constantly, all day. Fresh Restore, that's what did it for me. I did a complete Fresh Restore on it, turned it at brand new, and uh, it's it's working like a champ. Hasn't popped up at all. All right, man, well, keep up the good work, brother. All right, man, bye. Angel, thanks for the feedback. Back to the email bag. Hi, Rob. For the person in episode 389 that was looking for an email application that can perform a selected all messages option, Microsoft Outlook is a good app for that. Regards, James. Hi, Rob. So the App Store app received an update. It now supports 3D Touch. This is fine, but am I crazy for wondering why it still does not support Touch ID? Regards, Kevin B. No. No, you're not crazy for wondering that. Might be crazy for other things, but not for wondering that. It makes no sense that your fingerprint is not as important as your four-digit passcode. If anything, when you have not used your device for a while and want to buy something, it should require your fingerprint, not your four-digit passcode. And before you write in, yes, I know you can change the four-digit passcode to be longer, but the point is it can be as short as four digits and then have priority over your thumbprint. Before you write in about that, by thumbprint, I also mean fingerprint, because it could be any of your fingers. Or your toe, for that matter. Back to you, my bag. Hi, Rob. Hope this finds you well. I was just curious if you're still using the bumpies on your iPhone. I believe you have had them on an iPhone 6 Plus. I'm seriously considering them since I broke the screen on my employer's 6 Plus. Not good. Thanks. Regards, Scott. Scott, sorry to hear about that. And yes, still loving them, still using them, still loving them. I do recommend you also get a screen, a glass screen protector as well. Not just a screen protector, but a glass screen protector. Because, well, with any case, if you drop something on the screen, it can still crack. Bumpies save you from when you drop it. Recently, I was flying and I was using the wallet app with the boarding pass for Southwest. And the person checking the tickets asked, what are these white things for on the corners? And I said, it's the case. And she looked and like that was like I was strange and then said, wow, that's kind of neat. Hi, Rob. I found uh, there are a few different screen protectors out there that apparently um, are compatible to the ones offered by Bumpies. I'll uh, at least get the Bumpies on the phone. The funny part about breaking the screen is whether it was the dog's skull or the tile floor when I dropped it. I was training a new seeing eye dog, a male German Shepherd, who has a pretty big head. The phone bounced off his head and hit the floor. Thanks again. Regards, Scott. Scott, I'm going to guess it was the floor. Thanks to the multiple people that sent in this next one, which is for the Kickstarter project called Pictar, spelled P-I-C-T-A-R. What does Pictar do, you ask? Well, they say it will, quote, unleash the power of your iPhone's camera with much better pictures, time after time, unquote. Initially, this was not for the 6 Plus and 6S Plus, but the goal of 150K, stretch goal that is, unlock that option. 
So now this is for every iPhone from the iPhone 4 and later. So any iPhone that was introduced from the day the iPhone 4 was out and after, this will support. This one had a goal of $100,000, had being the keyword, as they're over 170 k and growing. You have until May 27th at 2 a.m. Central Time to fund this one, which if you are, man, you get interested really easy because I haven't really said what it does. The actual title of this project is Pictar, probably the best iPhone camera grip you've ever built. It is not a case as much as a handheld grip slash dock where you insert your phone and then have access to buttons on the grip for shutter release, exposure compensation wheel, smart wheel, zoom ring, and selfie button. It has a cold shoe mount and a tripod mount. If you are a photog, you will really want to check this out. Pricing on this would be $90 for all the models except for the 6 Plus and 6S Plus models, which are $100. Looks like shipping is November 2016. To find this, just search Pictar, P-I-C-T-A-R, at kickstarter.com or in the show notes for episode 390 over at todayinios.com. Thanks to Eric for this next one, which is kind of sad. There was a watch strap we talked about in the past that's supposed to use the hidden connector of the Apple Watch to supply extra battery life from batteries that are in the strap of the watch itself, essentially doubling the battery life of the Apple Watch. The reserve strap is the name, and episode 357 was the episode we talked about it. At that time, I said, quote, at $99, I would pull the trigger right away, but at $250, I'm going to have to wait until they're actually shipping and hear how it goes, unquote. Well, it seems Apple has shut down the project by locking down the hidden connector functionality in a recent watch OS update. Or as Reserve Strap team said on their site, quote, in recent watch OS releases, Apple made the decision to remove all functionality from Apple Watch accessories port, thereby blocking Reserve Strap's ability to charge the Apple Watch. This was a deviation from how the port functioned in all previous watchOS releases and appears to have been a deliberate effort to block development of third-party smart bands, unquote. Or put another way, I saved $250 by not pre-ordering one. Again, sad news, hopefully Apple unblocks the use of that port. I am starting to use my iPad Pro more and more, and the uptick and usage really started right when I received my STM iPad Pro Dux DUX case. This is a $60 case from STM for the 12.9 inch iPad Pro that has a great holder for the Apple Pencil and gives it protections from drops, even meeting the um, military grade drop tests. And best part, it works with Apple's smart keyboard case and the back of the case is transparent, so it protects the iPad Pro, but lets you see its beauty still. Once I was able to have the pencil with me and not worry about dropping it, I have just been using it a bunch more and, and letting the kids use it a bunch more. When I use it for meetings, I like going split screen mode, especially when taking notes at said meetings. I put the notes app on the left, I put the pages app on the right, and then the notes that I want to reference during the meeting are in pages on the right, and the notes I'm taking at the meeting are on the left in the notes app. I've had more than a few people ask me about the case this past month, as I have been traveling with it. I want to thank STM for sending this over for me to review. Guys, great job. I really love the case, and I really love the STM products too. My, my laptop bag, and then I have a, a duffel laptop bag, all STM. I have this iPad case now and, and then iPad case for my iPad mini. And my wife loves her iPad mini case so much that she would not even let me swap it out with another case that was sent over one time for, for review. Um, anyway, with regards to the STM Dux, I guess it's D-U-X, iPad Pro case, I will have a link to that in the show notes. And, and thanks, STM, for sending this over. I'm really getting a lot more use now out of my iPad Pro, and I'm not paranoid when the kids are using it either. Back to the email bag. Rob, I wanted to share two different things I submitted to Apple Feedback because I wonder who else has these issues. One, regarding the music app on my phone. Many, many times I've had problems, bugs, when I sync with iTunes. I have the album artwork for almost all my music, the larger library, about 60 plus gigabytes. 
I will have all the artwork correctly in the music app on my phone. And then when I sync with iTunes, it will disappear. This is not a pleasant experience. I don't really understand why it would happen because the artwork is already on the phone. That doesn't need to be synced. Uh, this has occurred over many versions of iOS and OS X and iTunes. Number two, also regarding the music app on my phone, I almost want to buy an Android phone every time I do a search in the music app. It's slightly maddening that it always defaults to searching iTunes music instead of my library. It feels like Apple is trying to sell me something every time I want to find a song that I own. I don't subscribe to Apple Music and don't have desire to. Plenty of music. I have to manually toggle the search results to my library each time. Please, please, please give me the option to change the default so that it goes to my personal music library when I do a search in, in the music app. I know the Android comment it was harsh. I just wanted to convey the gravity of this situation. So Rob, have you or any of the TIA listeners had either of these issues? I'd love to know. Also, if so, please let Apple know at apple.com slash feedback because many voices are more likely to be heard. Kind regards, Tracy. Well, Tracy, sorry to hear of your issues. If anyone out there has any advice for Tracy, shoot us an email, todayinios at gmail.com, or give us a call, assuming that number is still working. 206-666-6364. Hey, Rob, I work for a news station in Las Vegas, and I was wondering if you know of an app for my specific need. We get daily Nielsen ratings for my station and every other in town, I was wondering if there is an app where I can log each daily rating and get a number of different averages. For example, overall averages or even say averages on specific days like Mondays or Wednesdays. Thanks for the help. Regards, Roger in Vegas. If anyone has any recommendations for Roger, give us a call, shoot us an email. Hey, Rob, it's Brent out here in Oklahoma City. Um, just a couple things. I'm responding to a couple of your listeners that uh, the first one asked about some nice Bluetooth earbuds that were stereo, that had a microphone, that um, good quality and all that. And I would recommend to take a look at the Plantronics Backbeat Go 2s. Um, incidentally, we do the sell those on our store, uh, which is harboltcompany.com. Uh, that's H-A-R-B as in boy, O-L-T, company, spelled out, Dot com, um, but of course you can find them other places as well. But I really like those earbuds; they uh, are very comfortable, and they also come with a charging case. So while you're not using them, they can actually be charging up, um, and you can get like two charges out of the case. So basically, you can you know be able to get three full charges out of those Bluetooth earbuds uh, while you're out and about. So those are pretty nice. The second thing I wanted to address was the um, person that was interested in going with the iPhone SE, but they have a 6S that they just purchased, and they're only a few months in to their uh, uh, purchase of that. Well, I was in the same boat, and so what I did, what you have to realize is the iPhone 6S is worth more than the iPhone SE, and so I just paid off the uh, the rest that I owed on my 6S, even though it was like 500 and something dollars, uh, but then I went and I sold my iPhone 6S um, for like $650. And there's, you know, different avenues to sell those things like, of course, Craigslist or eBay or whatever. Um, and then I took that money and went and bought an iPhone SE. Um, and on the AT&T plan, you can do like the 12-month plan and put like 30% down. Uh, so you're really only financing like three fourths of the phone. And so it actually ended up lowering my monthly payments almost by half, if not more than half. So they might want to consider that, but that's exactly what I did because I wanted the iPhone SE. And so um, since the 6S is still worth so much because it's so brand new, they can get more for that and um, actually walk away with some money in their pocket after they pay it off. Um, not a bad deal there. The uh, third thing I was going to ask you, and this is more of an opinion question for you, because like you, I am also an Apple stockholder. Um, I'm curious as your thoughts. I know Steve Jobs has been uh, gone from us for uh, several years now. What are your thoughts on how Tim Cook uh, is doing as a, a CEO as compared to um, 
Steve Jobs. I'm just kind of um, just kind of curious as about your thoughts on that, and um, if you think um, that Apple's going in a better direction or a worse direction or whatever. My thought on the deal is that I always remembered, and I, I could be wrong on this, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I always thought that I heard Apple was really, when Steve Jobs was alive, was, uh, you know, saying, you know, you you spoke and we listened, and so we did this and so forth. But it seems to me that Apple is getting more away from the you spoke and we listened and more of the we're going to do what we want and you're going to either, you know, buy it or not buy it. Um I guess my, you know, the headphone jack removal thing that's uh, probably coming up is is a real good example of that because I don't know of anybody, I haven't talked to anybody that actually says, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that headphone jack being removed. So I'm just kind of curious as to your thoughts on um, that and how you think the, the, you know, the future of Apple is going as far as with Tim Cook at the helm uh, as compared to Steve Jobs. So just more of an opinion uh, question there. So anyway, keep up the good work. Appreciate you, Rob. Um, take care. Thanks. Hi, Brent. Thanks for your comments and questions there at the end. Now, let me just say this. When Steve Jobs was running CEO, was CEO of Apple and running Apple, it was definitely not a, oh, what do you want company? It was, what does Steve want this company? Steve would, his the whole thing was trying to figure out what people wanted before they even knew what they wanted. But he definitely wasn't asking people what they wanted. He was saying, here's what I think people want, and this is what we're going to do. Uh, you know, and removing things from devices, that, you know, that's always been kind of Apple's way. So removing the headphone jack, not shocking. Um, I believe it's going to happen. I agree with you. It's not a feature, as I said earlier in the show. Um, it's a hassle. But I think it's going to happen. And per Tim Cook as a CEO, I think Tim's been a great CEO. First off, Apple's market cap is greater now, much greater now than it was when he took over. But that said, where Tim Cook's specialty comes in is from his COO days, his logistics and supply chain um, experience. That's what Apple's at. I mean, Apple, when they launch a new iPhone and they're shipping 70 million plus iPhones in a quarter, that takes a CEO who understands supply chain like none other. I mean, Steve Jobs never had launches with anywhere close to the number of iPhones sold in the first quarter like Tim Cook has. So Tim is the right guy at the right time in the right place. Um, who's going to be the next CEO? My guess would be Eddie the Stuff Q uh, down the line when Tim Cook retires. That's because we're going to be moving more. You're going to see Apple moving more and more to services and, and special stuff, and that's where Eddie Q comes from. But for now, I think Tim Cook is absolutely positively the right CEO and doing a fantastic job. They just added $17 billion in cash last quarter. That, that's just unheard of. And, you know, Tim Cook was behind the, the, the reins when Apple became the most valuable company in the world. Comey, the FBI director, said they paid more money to have the San Bernardino's terrorist phone unlocked than he will make during the rest of his career, which is estimated to be over $1.3 million. So if you hear reports of the FBI paying over $1 million to get the iPhone 5C hacked, there is where that comes from. He did not actually say how much, so it could be a lot more or it could be right at a million dollars or less, and Comey is just bad at math. In any case, now that it's unlocked, what did the FBI learn? Well, initial reports were that the FBI was able to gather valuable information from the phone. What was said information? Well, it appears that there was nothing on the phone of value. That is said valuable information. But wait, how can nothing, zip, nada, info, at all, be valuable, you ask? Simple, according to the FBI. By knowing there was nothing on the phone, that knowledge and confirmation is valuable in that they can focus their efforts elsewhere. Uh, yeah. I tried to put a good analogy together on this one. And here's the best I could think of. Let's say you purchased a scratch-off lottery ticket with a chance to win $10 million. 
but you never scratched it off. And it was in a wallet of yours. And that was locked in a safe, which you lost the combination to. And a locksmith said, yeah, we can unlock this safe, but it's really tough. And it's going to cost you $1.3 million to unlock it. Well, rather than having to wonder if it really is a $10 million winning lottery ticket that's locked in the safe and, and face a life of uncertainty about said ticket, you go ahead and you pay the $1.3 million to have the safe opened to scratch off the ticket. And then guess what? You find that you did not even win another free ticket. Nope, nothing, zip, nada. But that is okay because now you know there was not a winning lottery ticket in that safe and you can sleep at night not having to wonder. And that is how the FBI justifies the time, energy, and resources spent on the great FBI v. Apple debacle. Hi, Rob. I just wanted to say a big thank you for being such a great advocate for the blind and the visually impaired. Although I do not know as to what level of your visual acuity may be, I, as well as many others who are blind or visually impaired, feel that you really understand the unique challenges we face in our daily lives when it comes to accessing our iOS devices. Being visually impaired myself, it means so much to me to know we have someone such as yourself who puts our issues front and center. So for that, I would like to say thank you. Also, I want to let you know that I have taken on a board member position, second VP at our local CCB, Canadian Council for the Blind chapter. Since I will have an active role in the group, my plan is to promote technologies to our members here in Newfoundland and across Canada. On the top of my priorities will be to let members know about your great podcast as well as the Google TII community. Keep up the great work. I'm also looking forward to episode 390, 391. All the best, Shane, St. John's, Newfoundland. Well, Shane, thank you very much for the very, very kind words. It's very, I am flattered. I am honored. Thank you. Um, to answer your question, my eyesight, uh, visual acuity is fine. Um, but I just understand that when it comes to podcasting and when it comes to using iOS devices, that y you need to focus on your community and, and, and there needs to be an understanding for that. And uh, I'm glad I can give a voice to that. So again, thank you for your kind words. Um, when you receive emails from people that talk about their iOS device changing their life and opening up a whole new realm in their life, I don't know how you can't get moved and how you can't try to help encourage that, especially on the developer side, to make sure that their apps are voiceover compatible. I know internally at Libsyn we make sure we do that. And I just hope if you are a dev, you really, really consider voiceover whenever you're designing your app and make sure your app works fully with voiceover. Hey, Rob, it's Chris DeBrody from Columbia, Missouri, reporting from you live in Orlando, Florida from Xamarin of All 2016. We just got done with the keynote, and I got to say, I'm really impressed. There were some things that I got leaked from an engineer from Xamarin, but then there were a lot of things that I didn't. The fact that the Xamarin Forms designer previewer is now there to where you don't have to build your app every time. You can actually see what you're building is amazing. I went ballistic over that. A lot of just awesome technologies such as a lot of cloud computing stuff, a lot of test cloud stuff, just a lot of amazing stuff in general. Then they redesigned their IDE, which is called Xamarin Studio, and it has a dark theme and all kinds of amazing stuff. A lot of different companies here, over 38 countries are at this conference. We also have 1,600 people attending today, which is massive down there in the conference room. Uh, and the best part is that they open source the whole Xamarin SDK and the MIT license so people can now help build upon it. Uh, that's just the gist of it. It should be a good rest of the, the conference. Uh, the very close session is the co-founder of Xamarin is talking as well as Apple's co-founder, Steve Wozniak. So that should be pretty interesting. But I just wanted to give my two cents and let the, everyone in the audience know it was a very amazing ex experience. Just the feel and uh, the quality of everything is just so high. It really reminds me of Apple's quality, you know, and they did a really good job. So just wanted to report that. Hope everything's going well, and thanks for everything you do. Thanks. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Chris, thanks for the voicemail message and for the feedback from the Xamarin Conference. And that's going to transition us well, very well into the next part of the show. Because now, up next, is the first of our four interviews I did while at Microsoft Build Conference. 
The interview was done on the show floor at MS Build, so there is some background noise, and some in quotes. I used the iRig Mic Dual Lav and the Boss Jock app on my iPhone to record this. Basically, no zip, not a cleanup was done on this, so you can hear how the iRig Mic Dual Lav works. The interview for the next episode will be done the same way, and then the last two I used a different slash professional setup. This first interview is with Payush from Azure team at Microsoft and runs about 17 minutes and 30 seconds. Thanks again. Uh, goes out to Microsoft for flying me out to cover the Microsoft Build event. And without further ado, here we go. Payush, welcome to the show. Thank you. Just quickly introduce yourself to the audience. So I am uh, Piyush. Uh, I am a program manager on the Azure Mobile Engagement Service, which is uh, part of Microsoft Azure. So I uh, I usually work on the uh, front end aspects and the SDK side of the product, and also work with the customers trying to understand uh, what features they want to build or what they want to get into the product. How long have you been at Microsoft? So it has been like little over seven years now. But uh, this, uh, so mobile engagement is a relatively newer service. So we released, we made the service public in last uh, October. So it's Azure Mobile Engagement. The typical problem space which mobile engagement is for is for like anyone who is developing a mobile app. So mobile engagement, it's, uh, it's built on Azure platform, okay. Microsoft Azure platform. And it's for any mobile app publisher or any mobile app developer. The, the idea behind is that today there are like so many millions of mobile apps in the app store mm -hmm. that the users have, like the app users, they have like ton of choices available. You publish one app and then they have like 100 apps which are doing kind of the same thing. Right. And so typically what happens is that the app users, they go to the store, they see some app which sounds interesting, they download it, they maybe try it for one day or maybe even one hour or even mm -hmm. just one minute. and Mostly, uh, they either uninstall it or they never come back to the app again. Uh, so it's like you have spent so much time in developing the app, putting in so much energy into it, uh, but if the app users are not using the app, then like, what's the worth of it? So mobile, Azure Mobile Engagement is trying to help the app publishers in trying to reach or engage with those app users. Is it that they're helping through metrics showing how much engagement there is or are you driving users? It's, it's much more proactive, I will say. So if you think about it, the only way for the app publisher or the app developer to reach the app users is on a mobile device is through push notifications. Right. And, but, but also, like we have to be careful there that uh, the world has kind of moved forward. Like previously, uh, it was all about, okay, I have developed an app and now I'm doing push notifications and I'm sending this one push notification to all my users. But in the new world, again, like because so much choice is there, that will come across as spam, users will get like, mm -hmm. will not like it and they will just like uninstall the app. The solution is to send much more like targeted and personalized notifications in this new world. And the idea behind like, how do you send targeted and personalized notifications? The idea, you can only send it by targeting, I mean like if suppose you have created like a small game with five stages and you see, you, so you, you publish that app in the store and now you're seeing that uh, like the app users, they are not moving beyond uh, stage two. Like they are maybe just stuck at stage two. A small percentage of users even though. Worst thing that could happen is that they just become frustrated with the app and they uh, uninstall the app. But you don't want that to happen. You, you, have, you have spent so much effort in the app. So one uh, interesting thing that could be done is that you send some kind of a tip to those users. Now you don't want to send this tip to all the users because it doesn't make sense to a user who is on level one or a, a user who is on level five. So are you able to say, okay, send this to only people that haven't opened the app in two weeks? Exactly, so okay. these are some of the scenarios that we can do. So with mobile engagement, one part is you can collect all this, what we call is behavioral analytics about your app users. Like uh, how many users are there for the app, how much time are they spending in the app, uh, which screens are they going? You can do additional instrumentation as in like what are they doing in the app, where are they clicking, etc. 
and then you can turn around and use this analytics data to create uh, rich segments of your users like the example that you just gave that I want to create a segment of all my iOS users who have not opened this app in the last 7 days or 10 days or 15 days and then once you ha have that segment then you can send very like targeted notifications to only this segment so that's all about like mobile engagement how do the developers get those tools into their apps? So we have SDKs available. So we have uh, an iOS SDK, both for Objective-C and Swift. So, so uh, it is with Swift. So it's, it's not. Swift. So it's not just like they have to be using uh, as yeah. area. So we have native SDKs uh, okay. for Objective-C, and uh, then there's a wrapper for Swift. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, SDKs if you're developing in Xamarin or if you're developing in Cordova or even Unity. Okay. So we have the, uh, so basically you can develop an iOS app and integrate mobile engagement in it, even if you're like you can, you could be either doing native development or you could be using any of these uh, wrapper frameworks like Xamarin, Cordova, or Unity. Okay. So you're, let's say you're developing, be it Swift or Xamarin or whatever it is, mm -hmm. what's the cost or to the is it a monthly fee? How does this work? So our pricing is based on the, the monthly active users of the app that you have developed. And that's the only one criteria that we have. Okay. Like if your app is successful, like basically your, your cost only increases if your app is really okay. successful. The more successful your app, uh, we will charge uh, for that. Okay. So that's also good in the way that we are also responsible to, towards the customers because we want to increase uh, their app usage through mobile engagement. Because if they are increasing their app usage, they are benefiting and we are benefiting. So that's why the cost has just like one parameter, which is monthly active users, so MEUs, what we call. Mm -hmm. And it's also like a tiered level, so first 100 users of your app, so it's all free, so okay. you can do anything. That's uh, what I was going to go at. Is, yeah, there, so, is there a free yeah, option yeah. To, so you, to try so, it out? And, so it's basically a SaaS service sitting on top of Microsoft Azure. So you can just uh, uh, sign up with Microsoft Azure, and you can use uh, Azure Mobile Engagement Service. Mm -hmm. So uh, and then so. Typically, the flow is that you sign up for uh, Azure Mobile Engagement, then you embed your SDK uh, in your mobile app, and then you can just like play with it. What are some of the types of apps that are been using? Is, is there a certain category or genre of apps that find this most useful? I will say that in today's world, uh, almost all the apps can use mobile engagement. The scenarios in which you will apply mobile engagement, they will vary. We have some scenarios which are applicable across all the mobile apps. So they are like, like I, I will I'll explain like one scenario. It's like uh, this, uh, suppose you have released your uh, mobile app in the app store. And suppose uh, for some reason, it is particularly crashing for say iOS 6 plus uh, users. You want to be proactive about that to in reaching those customers. So like if you have mobile engagement embedded in your SDK, then first of all, you will know that, okay, I have this specific crash happening on this specific device. Mm -hmm. And now with mobile engagement, you can create a segment and then just send a nice little notification to only this segment of your user saying that, hey, sorry about this. Uh, can, can you break it down and say, okay, I only wanted to send this push to people that haven't opened it in two weeks that are on an iPhone 5S? Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, uh, our rules engine allows you to build that kind of an expression. So, like, you can uh, have this and and or clauses. Uh, so, uh, you can build that kind of a rule uh, with mobile engagement. Okay. So I'd actually can, probably be more inclined, people probably more inclined iPad versus iOS, if they have the app as kind of universal. Yeah, so we, we, we capture those kind of uh, technical information because the SDK is embedded in the app, so it's mm -hmm. able to collect that information and send it to the backend. Mm -hmm. So you know that, okay, how many of my users are, say, on, uh, like, whatever, iOS, mm -hmm. uh, which which version, yeah. etc., things like that. So, yeah, so, like, talking about scenarios, so this is just a simple scenario that, like, if, if I am an app developer, I just want to reach out to customers who are seeing a specific error or a crash so that mm -hmm. I, I, I want to have that relationship with those app users so that they don't uh, 
feel bad and then they just like go to the app store and then read my app badly so i want to have that kind of a relationship now there could be like other more uh, industry specific scenarios also like if suppose you have a news application and based on the consumption i'll say it's like a uh, like a publishing app mm-hmm. and based on the article consumption from particular users maybe you have figured out that okay this particular user is uh, much more interested in uh, the us politics mm-hmm. so with mobile engagement you can again create that kind of segmentation uh, that whenever any new news article comes for that segment then you are only pushing uh, a proactively a notification only to these users who are actually interested in that segment and you're not spamming everyone on the push notifications mm-hmm. is it just a message or can you have uh, an actionable URL so the message comes they can click on that and go somewhere to a special message you set up for them or so uh, with push notifications we have like uh, it's it's much more like uh, you 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 get uh several uh, behavior and several features with push notifications mm-hmm. so high level we have like two branches of notifications so there is one which is what we call a system or out of app notification mm-hmm. so these are the notifications which typically show up in the notification center mm-hmm. uh, we also support the action button so you can like uh, quickly share or you can like do some action right there from the notification center and then the second class where we uh, uh, provide much more customization is uh, what we call as in app notifications so in app notifications are the ones which when i'm in the application then they show up to me so they could be like a small dialogue or like a small pop up which shows up for me or they could be like a full screen interstitial uh, that's showing up for me uh, with these notifications i i have more liberty to make them much more richer much more interactive much more visual like i can push out some rich html from my server uh, server side uh, mobile engagement platform to the app so uh if i want to some uh, send out like some image of an offer that's just going on today or this week or this month i can send that out from my backend to the users and coming back to what you're asking about the deep linking uh, aspects of the notification so you can embed these kind of urls into the uh, notifications that if the user clicks on the notification maybe uh, it could be as simple as just taking the user to a specific web page that i have hosted uh, mm-hmm. for the users or it could be that i click on this and the user go within the app to a specific screen and the uh, best thing is also that for all these notifications that the users are interacting with we also collect that analytics data about those uh, notifications so by that what i mean is that uh, you will get to see from the platform that how many notifications i sent out how many were actually received by the app users how many were actioned as in where they clicked or how many where they That's just where clicked gonna, simply ask, dismissed yeah, can you think okay send out the push exactly. but what was my percentage of yeah. actually click through on so that so it, it 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 tells you that like uh, uh whether what i'm sending to the users are they uh, are they really like clicking with it or are they like just like dismissing it blindly i've had i've heard some people where they use certain push notification systems and one of the big issues is uh they get a lot of users and from the time they send the push out from the first one going out to the last one could be a 2 hour window mm-hmm. is there any lag when when you're sending it broadcasting it to every user of the app so there is uh, so the notification is still going out through the apple push notification service mm-hmm. for ios mm-hmm. so we send out that blast like uh, first of all so we have that calculated segment of who which set of devices we need to send out the notifications mm-hmm. to so based on that we send out to the uh, what apns like apple push notification service so and then APNS is basically responsible for sending the notifications to the devices. Mm-hmm. Uh so in this flow there could be some lag but it's typically from when APNS is sending to the devices. Mm-hmm. And then there is also uh, like Apple also uses certain rules uh, like maybe the uh, the user has their device switched off or uh, they are out of range. Right. So like depending on those factors there could be some delay. Oh yeah, there's plenty of times where I've turned my phone back on in the morning also ping ping yeah, yeah a couple yeah. pushes a bunch of notifications yeah. suddenly showing yeah. up the service is it it's multiple platforms as we talked earlier what what percent 
roughly, or I don't know if you give this out or it's in public, uh, do you see I iOS users? I will say iOS and Android, they form the majority of the users. From what I have seen, I think it's not very clear distinction between the two. No, they, pretty close. Yeah, yeah, they are mostly like kind of even. Any big named apps out there you're allowed to talk about that are using it? Not right now, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, otherwise I would definitely have talked about some. Uh, okay. But, yeah. Yeah. but there's, yeah. some that, there's apps that people are using every day that... People that, are using, yeah. yeah, yeah they yeah. just don't know it. Yeah. Okay. Mobile um, engagement, uh, it's, it's something which is kind of becoming the necessity for mobile apps these days. Uh, like going back to my point, like because we have like so much option available in the app stores, uh, it's very difficult to create the differentiation. And uh, like one, one, the only place where you can make the differentiation between like a, an average app and an app which I'm really engaged with is when the app is kind of helping me in achieving my goals and not the other way where I have to go to the app to do things. Like simple example is like the airline apps, they are becoming very uh, mature in the sense the app for coming to uh, San Francisco for the build uh, conference, so I have this uh, app, uh, airline app, and I was noticing how it was like sending like helpful notifications to me just because I had the app. Like uh, here is your flight delay, flight delayed by like 20 minutes. Uh, there is a gate change, and now it will uh, be arriving like on this gate. So along the way, the app is helping me uh, rather than me again like going to the app again and again. So th I will say like that forms one differentiation between a normal app and a good app. If people would like to get some more information, how can they go, out and get, go about getting that? So I guess we can add some links to the podcast. Yeah. Uh, so we have like, so if you search for Microsoft Azure mobile engagement, that's the search query. Uh, you can just run it and we have like tons of documentation uh, split by the platforms. Uh, so I, I will like say that, I, I'm going back to the, your question, uh, what we didn't talk about. Uh, if you're developing apps for any platform, we have SDKs, uh, so you can just like come and start checking out so this mobile is engagement. Live now, you've got tutorials and to help live. people. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So we have all the all the documentation which is just there, uh, ready for you. All right. What kind of phone are you using personally? I myself use an iOS phone. Oh, yeah. an app. What's a one of, one of your favorite apps? You mentioned the airline app. What you want to give them? Uh, so I will say, um, surprisingly, it has become Apple News these days. Oh, okay. uh, Previously, not so much, but uh, these days I am seeing like as I'm using it more and more, how somehow it is like it, surfacing it's up. It's supposed to be learning. It's supposed to be spying yeah. on you yeah. and figuring things out. So yeah, that's that's one app that I frequently use. Uh, and then um, okay. that Apple News is pretty good. Well, Piyush, thank you so much yeah, for coming you. on the show. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again to Piyush for coming on the show. And once more, uh, the recording was done with the iRig Mic Dual Lav with, and the Boss Jock app on my iPhone. For more info on Azure, go to azure, A-Z-U-R-E dot Microsoft dot com. So yes, Azure is part of Microsoft, obviously. And uh, thanks to Microsoft again for having me out to MS Build for this interview, and we'll have another interview on the next episode. Hey Rob, ask Siri, what are you doing? You will get a lot of very interesting answers. Regard, Steve from Arizona. What are you doing? I just got back from Inner Mongolia where I helped set up 40 megawatt solar projects and hung out with the Yek. What are you doing? Just recycling my max aluminum, steel, copper, gold, and silver. You can do this, too, at any Apple store. What are you doing? Just following the electrons. I mean, the elections. What are you doing? I just found out I run on 100% renewable energy. So ask me again, and again, and again. What are you doing? CrossFit. What are you doing? Just practicing names. Ask me to pronounce your name. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm learning some new tricks. What are you doing? I'm honing my time travel skills. 
I keep bumping up against the Einstein puddle skeros and paradox, though. What are you doing? Helping Liam recycle motherboards into solar panels, so we can all have a brighter future. What are you doing? Zebedee, Zechariah, Zuroy, just working on my articulation. Ask me how I pronounce names. What are you doing? Just hanging out with Liam. What are you doing? I'm practicing being more helpful. I just like to help. Helping's my favorite. What are you doing? I just found that I'm powered by the sun. That must be where I get my sunny disposition. What are you doing? I'm just telling people on Apple TV what they should watch. Hint, it's not lost in space. Hermph. Just embarrassing. Well, thanks for your patience getting this episode out. I've been traveling a lot. Uh, I've traveled eight times since the beginning of February and the last five weeks in a row or four weeks in a row. So a lot of traveling that was going on. Good news is no more traveling until the beginning of July. So next time I'm going to be traveling is podcast movement. And so May and June, I should be here in town and not have to deal with any of these traveling issues. So the show should get back on a regular basis. So thank you for your patience while I worked through all these travel issues. Thanks again goes to Bowl and Branch for sponsoring this episode. Folks, go right now to bowlandbranch.com with bowl spelled B-O-L-L and use promo code TII to save 20% off the nicest sheets and cotton products you will ever own with free shipping to boot. And before we go today, I want to remind you to send in your feedback to the show, 206-666-6364. That's 206 Moondog, hoping those numbers still work. Or record your feedback and email it to the show, which is probably safer, to todayinios at gmail.com. Feedback can be a question or comment for something someone said on this episode, or it can be a question or rant you have about something else, an app, a product review, good or bad. As long as it's iOS related, it is welcomed. I'm always looking for new artwork to feature that you've created on an iOS device. Just put some TII branding on it and send it in. And of course, we're always looking for more music. Really, really need more music out of music. If you've created some music on an iOS device, please send it in so we can play it on the show. It's your show, your feedback, and contributions are greatly desired and appreciated. Also, don't forget to check out our moderated Google Plus community by going to todayinios.com slash community. Finally, check out the newly updated TII app, which is free to you. Search for TII in the iTunes App Store. is the best way to consume this show and to get push notifications each time a new episode of TII is released, which you never know when that's going to happen. It is fully voiceover friendly, of course. Please go right now and download the TII app if you don't already have it. And folks, that is going to do it for us today. Until the next time, I am your host, Rob, reminding you to phone different. This show is hosted on Libsyn.com and part of the Wizard Media Network. If you are looking for hosting, go to Libsyn.com, that's L-I-B-S-Y-N.com, for hosting for your podcast and for creation of your own smartphone app. The Today in iOS podcast can also be found on the free Stitcher radio app. Just search for T-I-I. Thank you.